Hey, Joan. Hey there, Forrest. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. That was a super smooth uh, connection, so that's great. <laughs> Off to a great start. <laughs> you never know with this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's a little nerve-wracking, but uh, mm -hmm. that right, was... It can be. Yeah, it was painless. But how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing awesome. great. It's nice and early on a, a <laughs> um, Saturday morning. Looks mm -hmm. like Smoothie is there. She's the cuz. I don't know, whatever. Oh, cool. <laughs> hey there. Awesome. Well, cool. For everyone who's joining and will be joining, um, I put it in the title, but um, I'm live today with Joan Gregerson. She is the author of a new book called Climate Action Challenge, a proven plan for launching your eco initiative in 90 days. Uh, so Joan, I'm glad to have you here today. Yeah, thank you so much. Really happy to be hanging out with you for sure. Yeah, and of course. And you're joining us from Denver, Colorado today. Is that right? Yep, exactly. Awesome. Cool. Yep. I love Denver. Great city. Yeah. Cool. Well, first, I was hoping you'd maybe just tell us a little bit about your new book. Yeah, would love to. Um, yeah, so it just came out on July 31st. And as Forrest was saying, it's <laughs> called Climate Action Challenge, a proven plan for launching your eco initiative in 90 days. And um, yeah, it's what, what's really exciting about it is when I was trying to figure out how do I get this message out about uh, how to be really effective for the climate. Mm -hmm. um, I've written a couple other books that people haven't read. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and like the people that did were like, wow, this was an amazing book, five stars. But mm -hmm. I really didn't want to write another book that didn't get read. And so what I what I did was changed it up so that it is an actual challenge. And okay. then we're running an actual international challenge. And when people sign up for the challenge, well, they can go to the website, get the book mm -hmm. and sign up for the challenge. So it's a way to demonstrate the book, not sure. just like put it out there and hope people that will read it or maybe they read it, but they won't actually take action. Yeah. So I'm pretty excited about that. I feel like I've got some war wounds from previous books. <laughs> sure. <laughs> a little bit of experience under your belt now. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think you kind of touched on this already, but, um, I guess I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail about uh, why you specifically wanted to write a book. I know that there's a, ch um, a challenge component to this as well, which kind of gives it um, sort of a social media um, sort of viral element. But I'm curious why, like why a book? I know that in the past you were an electrical engineer. Um, you taught English in South Korea, I believe, and even lived in Africa for a little bit. So you've done like tons of cool things. Um, but yeah, what led you to write a book? Yeah, great question. <laughs> and um, yeah, basically, from a very young age, I was always a nature kid. And sure. just, I mean, I grew up one of eight kids. So wow. pretty much we were all nature kids at that point. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> like big Catholic families and your mom would just say, go outside and play. Um, was that the same with you when you were a kid? Was it, it like, go was. outside and play? Yes, I definitely heard, uh, why don't y'all go outside and play? Uh, I had um, two other siblings, and we grew up in a neighborhood, so we'd have our friends over all the time. So, there were, like, for some reason, our house was always the one to go to. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, kids, why don't you get out of the house? I just vacuumed or something like that. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. I know I can relate. <laughs> yeah, right. So, I think all the kids and all the previous millennia were always just outside playing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so you had that kind of nature connection. Sure. Um, and just along the way, I kind of realized that, wow, nobody is really prioritizing the environment. I mean, I had no idea mm -hmm. from the age when I was 10 years old, and I wrote my first poem, got my first poem published about, um, about pollution. Yes. In Denver, people think of Denver as really clean air, but we mm -hmm. actually have a, a brown cloud that obscures the, your view. Um, mm. And so I wrote a poem about that when I was 10. And I'm like, I guess if I tell people, then they'll do something. Yeah. I had, you know, I had no idea. Now I'm 59 mm -hmm. that, you know, almost 50 years later that 
the environment wouldn't be a priority. It's like, we're made of water and we need air and we need mm. food and we need, it's, like it's obvious that we need this stuff and yet somehow it hasn't really happened. So a few years back, I started researching why aren't people able to make a difference and who, mm -hmm. and more pointedly, who is making a difference and how are they doing it? Sure. And, and so that's what I started researching and came up with this idea through my own experience and then starting to interview people that if you start a team, you can make a much bigger impact than if you do personally. And also if you try to change, just start with starting changing a policy, you right. can't just do it alone. So starting a team mm -hmm. is the way to change both your personal habits and change policy. And so the book, I knew I was going to write the book when I started the Green Team Academy in 2018. Mm -hmm. I just knew I needed more stories and I needed to test my theories sure. with, to, to get actual stories of people actually using it. Okay. So, so the book is really a distillation. It's the book I wish somebody would have given me. Like, mm. hey, you're 10 years old. You care about the planet? Yeah. You know, it's not going to happen. Like, the government's not going to do it. Your schools, they don't care. Yeah. Like they're doing other stuff. Use this guidebook, make it happen. So sure. that's kind of, that was the whole point behind the book. Cool. I love that. And I think, um, I think you actually sort of mentioned something like that in the book. Uh, forgive me if I get the term wrong, but was it reparenting where you were essentially writing, I guess, to your past self, writing the book that you wish you had back then. So that's cool. Yeah. And a lot of the people that I've worked with, it's been really interesting to hear that same story mm -hmm. where one person after the next says that from a very young age, they noticed like, wait, you know, this native American perspective makes a lot more sense. Sure. You know, to be, to consider the trees and the wolves and the right. rivers, our sisters and brothers and mm -hmm. you know, water is life. It's like, yeah, that that makes sense but the people around you are busy and not not a not prioritizing that yeah and so that's a common story that i hear that people feel they're the green sheep in the family yeah <laughs> i feel that <laughs> <laughs> really the same the same thing yeah so, yeah how does that it's so, so with on the reparenting, it's you mm -hmm. being the one that you wish would have listened to that person so you can help someone else. I love doing that when I have yeah. a, like a 10 year old kid who says, I want to do start composting and then bring it to a community garden and then grow the food and bring it to the cafeteria. And I'm like, yes, yeah, that's a circular economy. <laughs> he did not yeah, have to go to get a master's degree. Like, it's obvious to kids. So what about you, Forrest? Were you, you were saying you were kind of more tuned into this than the people around you? Yeah, I, I feel like, um, well, I mean, I've always been, I guess, kind of like a nature kid, like you were saying. Um, I grew up, I mean, I'm here right now, actually, in my parents' house in North Georgia. But um, we grew up close to the Blue Ridge Mountains, um, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful mountain range, um, just about an hour north of where we are right here. But um, I was lucky to grow up in like a, a neighborhood that had lots of access to like green space. And you know, I spent like a ton of time as a kid just playing in the woods. <laughs> so yeah. there is like a hill over behind. We, everybody here calls it a mountain, but it's it's not a mountain. And yeah. after if, if you from Colorado or somebody else from Colorado came here, they'd be like, <laughs> what? Have you guys ever seen a mountain? But uh, like how we call lakes, but they're actually just ponds. But sure. yeah, that's the same, right? <laughs> yeah. So I spent like tons of time doing that. And I remember like when I was a kid, my dad had this book that he read when he was a kid called My Side of the Mountain. I don't know if you've ever read that, but it was, is that is, sound familiar? Is this the kid that like is kind of runs away and then yeah. is in yeah, a tree? Sure. Yes. <laughs> oh, I yeah. love that book. He like goes and... I thought it was so cool when I was a kid and I was like, I want to do that. And my dad was like, you would die. <laughs> like, this is not realistic. Please do not get any ideas. Um, but I'm glad you like it. But um, yeah, it was like that, that book, I have to tell you that I was talking to my friends um, 
little boys. Well, they're not that little now. They're maybe like around 10 years old. Uh -huh. And I was telling them, I couldn't remember the name of the story. And sure. I said, um, because we were, we were at this little cabin, we were kind of playing in the woods around and said, mm -hmm. haven't you ever thought about that? Like you would run away from home and live in the woods, <laughs> yes. like find a tree that you could live in. And, mm -hmm. and they just looked at me like I was crazy. Oh, no. <laughs> That's what I said. I'm like, wait a minute. What just happened? Yeah. <laughs> Does, no, I, I mean, not that you're necessarily going to, you know, start sharpening your knife to do it, but just right. that that you would dream, they weren't even willing to dream about it. So I think that kind of shows the what's happened in the last couple of generations. Yeah, yeah, it's sad. Um, Cause that was definitely a fantasy of mine when I was a kid was living in like a carved out hemlock tree or whatever it was that Sam Gribbley lived in. <laughs> oh. Having like a trout farm and, you know, foraging for berries and stuff to eat, so yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, and then I guess more recently as I've gotten older, um, of course, like I, I mean, I, I kind of actually grew up, I mean, this was just kind of how I was socialized, I guess, being taught that like, you know, climate change and global warming was all a hoax and, you know, it was not real. And then as I got older, I, um, I think it was when um, Leonardo DiCaprio and National Geographic co-produced the documentary, um, I think it was called um, Before the Flood. But yeah. I just kind of watched that one day on Netflix with my roommate at the time. And I remember after uh, going into it, I was kind of like, I was much more open minded to the idea than I was before. But certainly after I remember thinking, like, oh, my God, <laughs> I've been wrong my entire life. Um, we have to do something about this. And I was just very distraught. And um, so that kind of got me involved. And of course, the IPCC special report on one and a half degrees Celsius came out. And that's kind of what made me realize like, okay, like nobody's doing anything about this. Like, I'm going to try to do something. I don't know what that's going to look like. But I have to otherwise, like, I'll feel guilty, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that's, well, and I love the, the stories for the earth, because kind of going back to what you just said was, yeah. it was somebody putting together that documentary yep, you know, like, yeah that that anybody i think we all have to figure out ways to tell the story and each right. one is gonna connect with somebody in a different way um, mm -hmm. so yeah we just have to do what we can and get the message out there exactly um yeah and that's kind of what led me to start this was realizing that you know you can spout facts and figures of people all day and sometimes that will change people's minds but like nine times out of ten probably not um and the thing that changed my mind was a story i mean it was a non-fiction narrative that came in the form of a documentary but mm -hmm. you know stories come in all different shapes and forms so yeah yeah um so i guess kind of going back to beginnings um you talked a lot at the beginning of your book about your career and how you had um, a hard time kind of figuring out what exactly you wanted to do to make a difference. Um, there's, I, I really love this story. You talked about you enrolled in a career counseling program, I think at the University of Colorado at Boulder, right? Right. Um, and you, you were talking with uh, your fellow, I guess, classmates who were in there with you. And uh, you kind of had this moment where you realized, um, like, I think it was the thread that runs through everything is what you said. Um, you just said, no matter what I'm doing, I, I know that being a nature protector and a connector is what I'm all about. Um, and I really love that metaphor because I feel like people, I mean, I feel like I felt this way. Um, people want to make a difference, but um, I remember thinking, I don't have a degree in environmental science. Like, what am I possibly going to do? Nobody's going to listen to me. And um, like, I don't even know where to start, but you don't have to have a degree in environmental science or something like that. You just need to figure out where you, I mean, where you already are kind of aligns with what you're trying to achieve, I guess. Um, so, but like, as you point out, like that's not true and uh, that you like have to have that degree and everything. And like climate change is this huge issue. We need everybody from all different walks of life working on it. Um, yeah. So how do you usually, I guess, kind of communicate that to people, people who are feeling like I have to have a degree in science or I need to have studied sustainability or something like that? Like, how do you overcome any objections that come up with that as well? 
Yeah, well, I think there's two parts to that. So mm -hmm. one, one is like that my story is that that I can prove that just being passionate about it, mm -hmm. um, just caring a lot doesn't is not what does it and education is not what does it because that's what I I wasted decades, mm -hmm. literally decades, being passionate, caring so much, but being almost completely ineffective. Sure. And, and so what the, so this is a really serious part of it is to understand that on a whole, we have been so ineffective. Mm -hmm. It's like if we were a pizza delivery place, <laughs> people would call, they'd give us their credit card. We'd say, sure, we'll deliver it. And then we just never do. And we go, sorry. That's a great we, analogy. We're passionate. We love pizza. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> Yeah, but you're not, we didn't, we haven't protected the planet. Mm -hmm. Like the, the statistics like that, the, the average population, wildlife population of amphibians, birds, fish, and mammals is now 40%. Yeah. What it was when I was 10 years old. So mm -hmm. a kid born now has four, let's say if, if zebras fall in that average compared to when I had 10. So it's yeah. like, we're, and the the UN biodiversity panel says we're running towards the edge of a cliff. Right. Like we don't know what the hell we're doing. Like we're doing it wrong. And so so that's one thing is that just going through and getting trained and trying to work in the field. So so my I got trained in engineering mm -hmm. and was working in building energy efficiency. Um, but the the thing is that if you just start a team in your community, you can mm -hmm. do things like the, the example I said earlier of the 10 year old kid who said, why don't we compost, grow food, put it in our cafeteria? That, <laughs> that one thing, if they were to do that, think of how much packaging, transportation, um, you know, wellness, like those holistic solutions that come at a community level are so much more powerful than right. what so what I was getting when and it's not to say that you shouldn't study environmental stuff I mean that's yeah great, but to understand that so the projects that we were getting when I was doing engineering um, one of the first places that I worked I was super excited about it because it was specifically, it was called Architectural Energy Corporation. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, wow, this is so cool. It's all about building energy efficiency. Um, but what happened was that I think one of the first projects that I worked on was for the Department of Defense. Oh, okay. And I was just like, what just happened? <laughs> Whereas a lot of my colleagues at that time, 1982, they went to work for aerospace and mm -hmm. you know, they went straight into defense. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to do that. Yeah. I believe in peace and environment. And then when I'm working, that's like, well, we're going to design, help the Air Force design more energy efficient housing. It's like that. I think that is the problem when you get into corporations and government that they're not working on the right problems right so you're doing your best on the wrong problem sure <laughs> whereas yeah. when you start in your community and you say hey you know like there's a group in in denver um i went to one of their meetings that it actually spun off i had mentored 20 teams throughout mm -hmm. um 2019 and one person showed up at the last meeting and I said, if you're not able to get things happening, you probably don't have enough partners. And he was like, that's it. Our little group has been flailing. So they partnered with 11 neighborhoods. Oh, wow. So they're all working together. But one of the things that one of the per people said is she said, we don't have bicycle sharing now mm -hmm. because the, the system that was there went out of whatever yeah but you know that's something that they can figure that out mm -hmm. they can make bicycle sharing happen because they're on the ground i was listening to um 
Planet Money, I think, and they were talking about yeah. the economics of these different things. And there's a, a, a term for that. And it's kind of, it's something about like local knowledge. Yeah. And things are planned. You think of like the communist planning that the problem was, <laughs> like but top down. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, we're, we're kind of, we're doing the same thing when a city gives, des, designs a climate action plan, mm -hmm. but they don't just go to the neighbors and say, what would you guys like to work on? And could we help you a little bit? Could we sure. start a website for you? Mm -hmm. Could we, um, what do you need? But the, the people on the ground, so like that, know, wow, I have this last mile issue I can't get from the train to home yeah. um, because there's no bike sharing anymore. And with a few people, they can solve problems like that easily. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of, I, I think it's, um, I don't remember the term for it, but it's basically kind of the idea that uh, systems have intelligence, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So like ecosystems or any kind of complex system like that. And I've been reading, um, you may have read it, The Overstory by Richard Powers. And, no, I haven't. Okay, that's a really great book, but it's it's all about trees and it's a work of fiction, but I'm planning on doing an episode on it soon. It's a really, really long book, so I have to finish it first. <laughs> but I feel like I've been reading it forever. But um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's all about how um, forests um, actually communicate with each other. And they have a sort of intelligence, actually, and they're able to respond to, like, outside threats. And, like, they can warn each other when something is, like, imposing on them or going to cause them harm. Um, they share nutrients and all kinds of crazy stuff, but yeah, it's, it's always, it's kind of the idea that a more diverse system, I guess, is more resilient. So, um, you right. know, they have that, that local, yeah. So that yeah. kind of knowledge. So like if there's roots or trees in one area that aren't getting right. enough, if they can communicate that up, yeah. Rather than somebody saying, okay, let's plant a forest. And mm -hmm. Exactly. The best. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's a good analogy. Yeah. So it's cool. I, it's kind of like how you talk about biomimicry in your book. So similar kind of concept, I guess. But the, if, the... if anybody hasn't read the book Biomimicry, that is definitely okay. one of those life changing um, mm -hmm. books, because the whole the whole principle of biomimicry is that that we as humans are a very young species. Right. Yeah. And that our biological elders are things like trees and jellyfish uh -huh. and uh, and oysters. And so the the example, the I think one of the coolest examples is so they, they talk about these different principles where uh, life does not use toxic chemicals mm -hmm. to do its chemistry. It uses ambient temperatures and readily available chemicals um and it's all biodegradable mm -hmm. like that's just the way life works whereas man we go down you know hundreds thousands of feet and dig things up and then do high temperatures and high yeah. pressures <laughs> and, and so they were given the example of how um so the hardest ceramic one of the hardest ceramics known and it's harder it's tougher than what man-made is is mm -hmm. the inside shell of uh, an oyster, so abalone. Oh, okay. Interesting. And the way it forms is it, it creates um, a template where it has like uh, different charged spaces on the template. Mm -hmm. And so then as the minerals float by, they, they lock into those, mm. those open spots on the template. Mm -hmm. And so it forms this incredibly strong uh, ceramics in water at ambient temperature with, mm -hmm. with minerals that are just floating by. I mean, yeah. that, that's freaking brilliant. Compared it is. To, you think mm -hmm. what we have come up with that's just like so nuts. And so mm -hmm. that's the thing is, and, and considering, understanding that indigenous cultures have been students of right. life students of nature and passing that on mm -hmm. as their primary, you know, generally as their primary thing. This is how we live in 
harmony. This is what we need to know. This is how you observe what's going on. This is how you know when to plant. So all this amazing knowledge that, that life is demonstrating. Um, and so understanding, you know, that <laughs> it's like, I was doing a little video the other day for our kickoff event, which we're doing this challenge kickoff, August 26th and 27th. Yeah. Um, but I was on mine, I'm like making a salad while I'm talking. Um, but, <laughs> but it's like, when you think of packaging, like I was cutting up a tomato. Mm -hmm. And like, what would Amazon have to do to send a tomato, like a fragile package, but nature like has this amazing, like it, it is able to protect the insides of a tomato. Yeah. And then it's biodegradable and it's edible and it has nutrient values. Mm -hmm. And so taking this view that probably what we came up with is kind of like the toddler version, <laughs> you know, yes. yeah. of like, oh, here, let's share mine. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, it's like, oh, okay, wait, you don't know how to do that yet. Mm -hmm. And so if we can come at it with more humility and see that, oh, you know, our designs are so inferior. Mm -hmm and that, that we can learn so much from nature. And I, I think through my training through engineering, I mm -hmm. was really, nature's designs were really dismissed as, huh. you know, kind of elementary, like yeah. basic, not creative. And it was like, oh, humans, we got this. Sure. But, you know, instead of, so like in the, in Mesa Verde, for example, is, uh, in Colorado, is mm -hmm. this ancient, I don't know if anybody's seen it, but this ancient cliff dwellings and where people located has this big, huge overhang, huh. south facing overhang so that in the summer, it stays really cool. It's like embedded in a rock, yeah, like big rock area. Mm. And then in the winter, the sun angle is low. So it comes right in and it charges all the rock. That's so cool. It, I mean, and that's passive solar. <laughs> but then when humans are doing it, it's like, okay, let me make an energy efficient heat pump. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah, but you oriented the building the wrong way to start with. Yeah. So, so that's the thing. I think being biomimicry really gives you the idea to be a little suspect mm -hmm. of human designs and to, to be an apprentice to nature as a way to do this. So if somebody hasn't, you know, if, if they're thinking, well, I don't have this kind of degree, that beginner's mind, like the 10 year old, mm -hmm. that's, that can be sometimes better because you're not getting so swept up in these other aspects, I think. Right, right. You're a little bit more, um, I guess, like in tune with things or you're not thinking, yeah. overthinking things, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Perhaps, but... Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I love that concept of biomimicry, uh, biomimicry, excuse me. Um, yeah, so I had one last question about finding one's place, so to speak. Uh, so you talk about the importance of writing a personal hero's journey in the book, when you're, I guess, trying to figure out what your role is and, you know, helping with climate change. Um, this is a literary concept that as you mentioned, comes to us from Joseph Campbell, who is a literary critic and author. Um, so some of the best stories in the world, as you also point out, come from this model. We've got like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. And, you know, like, I think um, the Odyssey is also another one that you could um, hold to that model. Um, so that's great. And like some of my favorite stories come from this too. But uh, there has been some criticism of the hero's journey with people saying, you know, it's, it focuses too much on individualism or it's like usually told from a male perspective or it, you know, is too embedded in like Western ways of thinking. Um, but there are some really strong narratives that have come from this. And I, I don't think it's a bad thing to, you know, right. try to like find your, you know, try to figure out like your place using this model. But I'm curious if there are some others you've been talking about, I guess, Native American culture and how indigenous ways of thinking um, are usually more sustainable, or I say usually, pretty much always more sustainable right. than the way that we do things. I'm wondering if there are any um, other kind of story models from other cultures or just other ways of thinking that you also find helpful in approaching this problem. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great idea. And I love that. And I think this is what we're doing with the environmental stuff is uh -huh. questioning everything. Yeah. You know, questioning like, oh, wow, what is the rule? Why do we have air pollution? Like, mm -hmm. is racism and systemic oppression actually why we have air pollution? Right. And, you know, and so I think it's great to, to, question and kind of poke holes in in all this stuff one one reason that i recommend so so throughout the book um mm -hmm. there's something like 50 writing activities which i didn't realize until yeah. i made a workbook and it was 57 <laughs> yeah. pages and it was like oh my goodness that's a lot of writing um but uh i really think that when you write you you know, there's something magical that happens. Yes. Yeah. That like, you don't know, everybody who writes knows this. You don't know what's mm -hmm. going to come out of your pen or your typing. Yep. It's going to tell you what, what you think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah. So, so that's, I think that's part of it. But the other part is, um, so, so there are other writing activities in there. There's doing your personal vision statement uh -huh. and, you know, really trying to dig deep and ask yourself, like, what is my life about? Yes. What, you know, what do I really care about at the end of my life? Um, so that's another way to say it is, I mean, I like to call it the deathbed reflection, but some people <laughs> get mad at, like, I actually had somebody get mad at me about that. And it's like, oh, well, okay. Um, but it, it's, kind of true you know like you are going to die yeah and with any luck you'll be there we'll be able to reflect in those mm -hmm. last few moments um but i think that's another way to do it is to imagine yourself at the end of life and mm -hmm. looking back um but but one reason that i like the hero's journey is because what i've found is especially in white culture and more privileged more affluent um, that most of us have been raised to think that the government is doing what they need to do. We just need to vote and yeah. things will be fine. And that's because for me, speaking from my experience, you know, I got a good education. Mm -hmm. I wasn't hungry. I had plenty of opportunities. Um, and so the system pretty much worked for me. Yeah. So I don't have to be a hero. Mm -hmm. I just have to vote, go to my job, everything will be fine. What I've noticed is that some of the people that I really admire um, that are in this same space working on environmental justice, mm -hmm. their stories are more like, oh, hell, heck no. <laughs> you know, from day one, my parents said, you know, this is you need to you need to be a community organizer you mm -hmm. need to stand up for yourself you need to be out there and advocating and i don't really like to use the word fighting but you know yeah to to, to make sure that you're standing up for yourself and your community and mm -hmm. so what the hero's journey story does is for people that don't see themselves as an eco leader you know sure. they're just oh i recycle like, yeah yeah well that and look where that got us yeah. <laughs> um, so what i'm trying to show them is that in your life you started out in your family of origin mm -hmm. and you had you had beliefs that that were great and you had beliefs that were limiting and sure. so those those great beliefs got you to a certain point um and then as like Russell Brunson uses this concept of an epiphany bridge story, okay. which is same thing, more, more detailed, but the epiphany is like you, you leave your family of origin, you go off and do something. So this could be moving to another city, getting a job, um, travel, something. And yeah. you realize, oh my gosh, like I think in Korea, Wow, their food was so much better. They were so much closer to the land. Yeah. And like men are eating tofu and vegetables. And I'm like, <laughs> I love Aha! it. Yeah. So it's like this epiphany. So this, so you, you have these realizations that the people that you started with haven't had. Yeah. 
And so then when you come back, you have something to offer them that they have not been able to see. Okay. And so when you write your hero's journey story, you see that your struggles, your perspective is really valuable mm -hmm. and that you can be a leader in, in moving people just like you. Sure. And so being able to say, I understand what you're thinking because I thought that too. Mm -hmm. And then I tried these things and I found out that this problem that seemed impossible to solve, mm -hmm. all these other people just solved it and this is how they did it. <laughs> so then you can come back. And so it's a way to, to get people out of the, that mode of, oh, you know, yeah, let me just recycle and turn off the lights. Sure. Um, when I leave. And that's the other thing that I invite people to do is to create, and this might go along more with like the more fictional stuff, but mm -hmm. create an avatar of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, some kind of, I, it's been really interesting what people have said. Some people will choose an animal. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I'm a wolf or I'm an eagle. Um, some will choose a mythical character. One of the ladies I used to coach, she, she was Xena, uh, mm -hmm. the warrior princess. Cool. And then her dog, her favorite dog from childhood had died. And so she mm. just imagined her and her dog just cruising oh. around <laughs> doing <so> things. <laughs> I know. So, but, but the thing is that when you're, when you're trying to get your city council to change the laws, right. And you just go in as, okay, I'm Joan Gregerson. I live at, you know, 800, whatever. I live mm -hmm. here and I have this opinion. You know, it's like, ah, okay, whatever. You know, yeah. you're one of a million. But if you know in your heart, you're Xena the warrior. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, the warrior princess. That, that like, you know that you're having this more kind of mythical experience. Yeah then I think that kind of thing um, can fuel you. And yeah. so I don't know, you had asked about maybe a, um, a Native American perspective or something. I'm yeah. not really much of an expert on that other than <laughs> this idea that just spending time with nature and observing, you know, if you're on a walk, maybe just touch the leaves of the tree and see how they, like, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Are you, are you healthy? Are you struggling? What's going on? Mm -hmm. You know, just being, I think Michael Alcazar, who has this project, 1 million trees for Colorado. Okay. Um, he's like, you know, I want to inspire people to plant trees. And he tells them, he tells them just go plant trees, but he mm -hmm. doesn't, what he really wants is people to be in relationship with trees. Okay. So you plan a tree and then you commit to taking care of it for the rest of your life. Yeah. And so I think that, um, you know, just any way that you can break out of this cultural gridlock that we have right now um, is great. And whether mm -hmm. it's with stories or uh, anything that works, basically. Sure. Cool. Yeah, I love the idea of using... Uh, narrative structures, I guess, to uh, try to get people to do something about climate change and uh, using it to try to help you find your place within that. So I think that's really cool that you use that example. Um, cool. So moving on from, I guess, beginnings and finding your place, um, you have this chapter, I can't remember now which chapter of the book it's in, but I'll just read the quote that I have from it. You say our our ability to act starts with our ability to suffer with the world. And I read that and I thought that was a really, really great quote because it articulates something that I have felt before uh, many times, but especially when, like I was saying at the beginning of our conversation, you know, I, the 2018 IPCC report came out and um, it was the one on one and a half degrees Celsius. And I remember reading that and I kind of freaked out and <laughs> as... <laughs> You probably should if you've exactly, read that. Exactly, right. Yeah. Yeah, but I just remember it was uh I don't know how else to describe it other than a grieving process. It 
and have now we have terms like you know eco anxiety or climate grief or you know things like that solastalgia i think is the one that i've heard recently um Wait, what was that one i think it's um solastalgia s-o-l-a-s stalgia <laughs> wow but yeah it's i think it's kind of like the um it's sort of this profound sense of like deep loss that people mm -hmm. feel from yeah. seeing like the degradation of the natural world and from like species extinction and that sort of thing um all things that should naturally be depressing and sad but um but i i kind of sat with that feeling for a really long time and i was like what do i do now um i feel like i need to just grab somebody by the shoulders and scream at them like <laughs> we have to we have to stop doing what we're doing it's not working um and i was i think like right after i read that report i was you know like I lived in Nashville, Tennessee at the time, and I was like emailing the mayor's office and I was emailing my, my congressperson. I was like, hey guys, what are we, what's our plan on this? Cause this is super bad. And <laughs> like, we're gonna be in a really bad spot if we don't do something about this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but the thing that eventually, um, I, I guess that I came to out of that was uh, taking action um, is the only thing that would make me feel better. And, you know, what led me to take action is sort of having a broken heart. Um, and I got involved with tree planting. There was a, a really great organization in Nashville called the National Tree Foundation that organized, you know, like reforesting the urban canopy in Nashville. Hmm. Um, so I, anyway, I went to a lot of those and it helped me feel better. But all that is to say, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the importance of feelings in the climate movement and how it's crucial for people doing this work to acknowledge those feelings and to have them validated. I feel like we get so caught up in, you know, like plans and, you know, citing statistics and scary things, but um, feelings play a huge part of that too. So I'm curious to hear what you think on that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that link between feelings and action is so important. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to definitely talk about the climate action challenge. So I'm just cutting to the yes. chase. Yeah. There is a way to take action. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that that quote, um, Joanna Macy, I think, is yeah. the, the person that I read the most about that. And, you know, she she talks about how you you can't if you separate yourself. I think she was the first person that really articulated what what I later understood is I was always like, why don't people get this? <laughs> yeah. Like you're you're seventy percent water. How can you ignore water? Yeah. Like how how can we be so divorced from it? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that she and some of the others have said is that it's not because you don't care enough. It's because you care so much, and right. yet you feel powerless. Mm -hmm. that you have to turn it off. And it's kind of like if you are stopped at a stoplight and a homeless person asks you for money yeah. and you don't want to look at them, it's not because, for me, it's not because I look down on the homeless person. It's because I feel so bad that yeah. I can't just wave a magic wand and, you know, if they have whatever is going on, that Fix probably... It happened yeah. to them throughout their whole life and mm -hmm. and so i think a lot of people have that that separation where they just close it down because they can't handle it yes. and so knowing that the first place that you start is by feeling those feelings and for a lot of people know about greta thunberg yeah. from sweden Mm -hmm. What most people don't know, if you haven't read their family's book, Our House is on Fire. It I is, haven't yet. It is craziness, but it's, you know, it just tells. So people think, okay, well, Greta got out there and, you know, she put her sign and she did her thing. But right. the, the backstory is exactly what you were saying was that she she was a sensitive person. And yeah. is, I would say. Um, and was in classes where they were showing a little video of polar bears dying. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then it's like, all right, now it's time for recess. Go out and play. <laughs> yeah. And the other kids <laughs> go out and she's just like, wait, hang on. We're not going to talk about this. Yeah. And, 
you know, and she's right. Mm -hmm. But, but, um, but it was that increasing paralysis mm -hmm. of just like you said, like emailing your, your mayor and yeah. everybody, your, your representatives and saying, what are you guys doing about this? So it was her increasing feeling and understanding that people are not taking this seriously yeah. enough that, that made her collapse and she stopped eating. Mm -hmm. um, she was crying all the time. She wasn't yep. sleeping. The family was trying to get all this help for her. She was on the verge of getting checked into an eating disorders hospital. Yeah. Um, and her dad took her to, uh, I forget, there was some kind of meeting with some other people that are working on some climate science stuff. And so then she got the idea, okay, I'm going to go stand out there with my sign. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, you're going to stand, because she couldn't speak to people. She, you know, stopped talking. And mm -hmm. her dad was like standing all on the edge, just watching her. Is she going to be okay? Yeah. But it was when she stood out there with her sign and people would say, what's this about? She could talk to them. And so it is that there is this process that there's denial. And so it's probably all the same stages of grief. Yeah. Um, but there's denial and that's where most people are stuck. Yeah. And, and so feeling, giving people a way to feel the feelings for a short time and mm -hmm. then take action is, yeah. is the most important thing. And I think, you know, taking action in community, I wish that a lot of the youth leaders could also get this message about starting teams Mm -hmm. small teams in their community and doing things because not only does it nourish the community, but it nourishes them. Yeah. I totally believe in that. Um, yeah. For a, I, I can't remember now how long it was, but there was like a brief time when I was involved with the sunrise movement in Nashville mm -hmm. and um, you know, going to the first couple meetings of that, was mm -hmm. really cool and it was super inspiring yeah. because you know the sunrise movement i'm sure you know is like a fantastic organization and they do all kinds of great work but um we have like high school kids who are coming to that from all the way from franklin tennessee which is uh, if you've never been to nashville it's about like it's almost an hour south of nashville it's pretty far oh, away wow. but you know they had found out about this by themselves and they took the initiative like there was a kid who had her mom drop her off and I was like, that's so freaking cool. Like, I wish I was that cool when I was in high school. Um, and, you know, I say high school, she was probably like 15. Um, so it was just so cool to see things like that. And you could tell it, it really did, you know, help people feel better that they were actually, you know, working on something productive uh, to take action on that. So I yeah. totally believe in that. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, well, I don't want to go the whole time without talking about your climate action challenge. So yeah. maybe we can end on that. We've got Instagram's going to cut us off at 11 o'clock Eastern. So uh, maybe we can talk about that really quick and wrap up. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the exciting thing is mm -hmm. here's my number one message. The number one climate action is start a team. Yes. And, um, the, the whole reason for that is that if you try to do something alone, like we have people that are starting teams to do voter registration. Yep. Like doing voter outreach. But you think about it. I mean, I've done this where it's like, okay, I'm going to help work on that. And then you mm -hmm. sign up and you do one thing and then you're going to do more, but then that time doesn't work. And it kind of peters out. You yeah. know, you just get distracted, even though it's the top priority. So understanding that having the coaching, having the mentoring, having the support can actually help you make something happen. That's what we're doing in the Climate Action Challenge. We have a team, a support team of 66 people right now. Cool. So 40 some of them are mentors from around the world. We've got people who've been doing tree planting projects in, in Zambia and Uganda. Sure. Uh, high school or yeah, high school teacher who just did a befriend a tree program for <laughs> her and her students planted 500 trees during the pandemic. Wow. 
because she contacted students individually and said, are you lonely? Would you like a friend? No. Because I have a tree seedling here. You can name it, take it mm -hmm. home and take care of it. And you can bring extras and help you if your neighbors are lonely, if they need friends. Um, so we have- a great people. idea. Isn't that so cool? Uh-huh, yeah, And I again, that. yeah, again, it's just like, so when you work with people and hear their stories, it's like, great idea. Because other people are saying, oh yeah, we had to cancel our tree planting because of COVID. But sure. here's a teacher in Nigeria that just figured out how to plant 500 trees with yeah. students. She started an NGO that all the officers are her students. <laughs> That's awesome. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yes. And, and so when it's like, oh, what can I do? So the mentors, we've got people that are our zero waste experts, mm -hmm. um, people that are project management experts, researchers, mm -hmm. uh, marine biologists, people who've done virtual events. So no matter what you want to do, youth, like all ages from the Philippines, like all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and because, you know, what works in India may not be the same thing that works in Canada. And so right. we want to make exactly. sure, that, you know, people that are understanding what could be a good option for you. Mm -hmm. um, so you can go to climateactionchallenge.net and sign up for the challenge. It's free. The last day to register is August 31st. Okay. We have a kickoff event, August 26th and 27th. And on those two days, we have, um, we're doing a, a Zoom call in the morning, which will be just like our kickoff palooza. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And so just everybody can just pile on there. We'll do some breakout rooms. So you can just hop in with random people from around the world. And mm -hmm. um, it's so neat when we do those and just say, what are you interested? And people write in the chat even like, I want to start composting at my school. I yeah. want my faith community to do um, uh, racial justice dialogue. Mm -hmm. Like it could be anything. Um, so, so the kickoff event we have, um, expert videos from all of our mentors. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know what are tools for doing voter registration, or you want to know how to do an ocean cleanup that actually leads to policy changes yeah. and how to get tons of volunteers to help you, then there's a video there about that. So pretty much anything that you could think of, we have videos on, you know, how do you do a minimalist lifestyle? How do you, yeah. uh, whatever. So, mm -hmm. Um, that's what, so the kickoff event is our live sessions. And then we have happy hours. So okay. Zoom happy hours. So if you want to be in the soil health and regenerative ag happy hour, go for it. Mm -hmm. We have one in Spanish, one in, awesome. one in French. Um, so we've got like, if you want to do family, school and youth initiatives, a lot of our mentors work there. Mm -hmm. So you can hop in the happy hour tell them what you're thinking about and they'll be like, yes, do it. Yeah. And so then once people join, so we have this challenge portal, that's basically this big forum with all these different rooms in it. Mm -hmm. You can get into any room you want. If you want to get into the Africa room, the tree planting room and the youth and family initiatives, you can hop into any of those and ask your questions yeah. um, from people that, that are excited to help you make it happen and kind of coming back to the book. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing, so is a, this 90 day challenge is based on the concepts in the book. So yeah. if you haven't downloaded the book, head over to climateactionchallenge.net. You can get the book for free mm -hmm. through August. Um, but then challengers will also get um, the workbook so they can do all of their writing in one place. Um, and then we're going to be featuring a lot of the challengers um, in our summit in December. So okay. it's, it's a pretty exciting thing. And just being on the meetings. Yeah, because the environmental stuff, it can be depressing. Yeah. And a very negative feeling to say, like, why are you doing that? Stop doing that. And Oh, my <laughs> God, this is terrible. So sure. instead, this changes it around and says, hey, like, there's a girl that signed up. Uh, a couple of days ago, she wants to get her campus to be pollinator friendly, to become a bee campus. Okay, if you, cool. If you go to climateactionchallenge.net, there's a link there and you can look at what all the challengers are doing. Yeah. Um, but 
it, it's really inspiring. Like one high school girl's like, I'll plant 10, I'll, our team will plant 10 trees. Another person's like, I'll plant 15,000. Wow. <laughs> it's like, either way. Yeah. <laughs> Great. You know, everybody is welcome. Yeah. And every little bit makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the start a team, start a team. Yes. Don't do this stuff by yourself. Start a team. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Oh, well, I think uh, we can go ahead and wrap up there before Instagram kicks us off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, but yeah, Joan, it was so great talking to you. I'm so glad that you came on uh, Instagram live with us this morning and I uh, hope we can keep in touch. What you're doing is so important for us. And, you know, just this thing of finding ways for people to express themselves. And, mm -hmm. you know, you were talking about expressing feelings and a lot of times that stuff is hard to do. Yep. You know, as you said, you just want to like <laughs> shake somebody and go, oh, my God. Yeah. So using stories as a way to allow people to kind of break, break through their shell um, mm -hmm. to, to get there is is pretty neat. So I think you're what you're doing is cool. There's one of the ladies that uh, one of the mentors has a, a program called Eco Fiction. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and so that is one of our one of our happy hours. Mm -hmm. is um climate change through the arts climate action yeah. through the arts yeah there is um I, I think it's um dang i can't remember the name of the website now i think it's i think it might actually just be called climate change in the arts uh it's a canadian mm. run website but it, it's just all about highlighting um artists i think mostly visual artists who mm -hmm. are using that as a medium to mm -hmm. i guess raise awareness about and just process complicated feelings about climate change and of course, I'm a huge advocate of using fiction or any other storytelling device as a way to do that. So that's super yeah. cool. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we definitely have some folks um, on. I'm trying to get my screen back there. We definitely have some folks that are doing. We have one person that does um, kind of eco clubs, but all with uh -huh. drama. Okay, cool. So helping students use drama as a way to to reach out and make, make change in their world. Yeah, it can be any kind of... Uh, I guess, form of artistic expression. I, I know that I, I kind of talk a little bit more about books, I feel like, than some other mediums, but there are even video games that talk about this and use that as a way to get it out. So whatever, whatever works, works man. better for whatever you. Whatever works. Yeah, whatever you need to do. So exactly. awesome. Well, Joan, right. I will talk to you later. Thank you so much for coming on Stories for Earth Instagram Live and be well. Yeah, thank you so much. And I hope everybody joins us over at climateactionchallenge.net. Yes. Grab the book for free during August and sign up for our kickoff event and hope to see you there as a challenger. All right. Thanks so much, Forrest. Have a great mm -hmm. day. You too. See you later. Okay. Bye. Really Bye. Appreciate it. Bye.